If you and your family were trapped in a secret ritual that was started before you were even born, what would you do? Their entire life is playing out according to someone's sinister plan, and by the time they realize what's going on, it might already be too late. I'm here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the evil cult in Hereditary. For this unsuspecting family, all hell is about to break loose. On the morning of their grandmother's funeral, this father Steve wakes up his son Peter to start getting ready, asking him if he's seen his younger sister Charlie. While their mother Annie waits in the car, Steve finds the girl sleeping up in the treehouse after spending the whole night outside. At the funeral home, Annie says some words for her mother, commenting that they had a loving but very distant relationship, and because of the woman's private habits, she hardly recognizes any of the people who came to pay their respects. The family returns to their house once the service is over, quickly getting back to their usual routines. The only person who seems to be feeling any loss is Charlie here, who refuses to talk to or even look at her mother when she comes to check on her. Annie tells the girl how she was always their grandmother's favorite, the woman even insisting on being the one to feed her instead while she was a baby. Nervously, Charlie asks who's going to take care of her now that she's gone. Her mother laughs and says that she will, of course, trying without success to talk the kid into crying and letting out her emotions. Looking behind her, she notices the word Setany scratched into the wall above her head, but kisses her a few more times and leaves without asking for an explanation. Back in her studio, Annie opens up a box of her mother's things and finds a book titled Notes on Spiritualism. Inside, she uncovers a handwritten message from her mother, asking for forgiveness because, in the end, the rewards will be worth their sacrifice. Stuffing the book back in the box, Annie turns off the lights and goes to leave, but when she looks back, she sees a ghostly vision of her mother standing there in the shadows. She thinks about telling her husband what happened before going to bed, but for some reason decides it's best to just keep it to herself. Okay, this might have seemed like an ordinary funeral, but Grandma, the friendly ghost here, popping in for a late night visit from the other side is a pretty clear warning sign that something strange is going on in the background. Before we follow the family any farther down the spirit hole, let's take a minute to point out a few red flags that they haven't picked up on and see what we can figure out. Starting back at the funeral home, one of the first things to notice is that Annie and her mother were both wearing the same gold necklace during the service. Since the woman chose to be buried with it, that means that it obviously held a lot of spiritual importance to her. But Annie mentions in her speech that she didn't know anything about her mother's personal beliefs. From what we can see, it looks like the memorial is following Christian traditions, but the necklace more closely resembles something you'd see from cultures based in Asia or the Middle East, like Hinduism, Islam, or Judaism. So what exactly does it signify? Annie here might not think that it's important right now, but if it were me, I would have been curious enough to do some research into the symbol and tried to figure out what the old woman was getting into for all those years. Well, the truth is that you won't find it in any of the most widely practiced religions because it's actually a simplified version of the seal of an extremely powerful occult being. I'll save the specific details for later, but that should immediately give you cause for concern. It looks like Granny was dabbling in practices that you do not want to be getting involved with, which could explain how she has the power to linger on as a spirit even after her death. Things got even stranger when she was tucking Charlie into bed and noticed the word Satoni scratched into the wall above her. Instead of questioning it, her mother decides to just write it off as a product of the kid's quirky behaviors. But personally, I would have wanted to know where it came from and what it means, since that's definitely not a word that you pick up while watching Sesame Street. Although its history is complicated, it's generally believed to be a word of power used in necromancy, the magical practice of communicating with the dead and summoning their spirits. In other words, it's a very concerning thing to suddenly become part of your 13-year-old's vocabulary. Honestly, even without looking it up, just the fact that it sounds an awful lot like Satan is enough to get my attention here. To protect myself and the family, I would have tried hanging a religious symbol like a cross over the word while I ordered some replacement wallpaper and questioned the kid on where she heard it and why she felt the urge to write it up there on the wall, since there's no way to know who or what she might accidentally invite if she keeps it 
up. The book about spiritualism is a bit strange, but it's not an immediate red flag. What is alarming, though, is the note from her mother, especially the part about sacrifices being worth it in the end. We don't know what the old lady meant by that just yet, but my gut feeling tells me that it's not good. And seeing her pop up in the shadows when I turned off the lights would have been all that I needed to see before I started taking some action. After all these strange happenings, my first instinct would be to go spend the night thoroughly going through all grandma's old stuff, and throwing away or locking up anything that looked like it was giving off evil vibes. It's very possible that buried somewhere in those boxes is some evidence that would give me more information about what she was up to, where Charlie picked up that word, and why Granny's spirit is lurking around the house instead of moving on to that big retirement home in the sky. There's absolutely no way I'd allow so many spooky things to go down the night after her funeral without at least looking into it. But for whatever reason, Annie seems to be determined to ignore the red flags, so for now, we'll just have to wait and see. The next morning at school, Charlie here starts putting together one of her makeshift toys instead of finishing her quiz. Suddenly a pigeon flies into the classroom window, breaking its neck from the impact. As everyone else is heading home at the end of the day, Charlie finds the bird's body in a bush outside, leaning over her shoulder to make sure that no one's watching. She takes out a pair of scissors that she stole from the teacher's desk and snips the bird's head off, stashing it in her pocket. When she turns around, she notices a strange older woman waving to her from across the street. While working on her models, Annie starts doing some research on spirits and communicating with the dead. She hears her husband getting in and goes to say hello, but on her way, she notices that the door to her mother's bedroom is wide open. Looking inside, she sees a strange black triangle carved into the floorboards. She asks Steve if he was the one who left the door open, but he says he hasn't gone in there, so they decide to lock up the room just to be safe. Peter comes with a phone call for his father from the cemetery, the worker informing him that the old woman's gravesite was desecrated overnight. When Annie asks him what's going on, he lies and tells her that it was just a billing issue, and she says she's going out to catch a movie. In reality, Annie heads to the local community center where a support group is holding a meeting about coping with the loss of a loved one. When they open the floor to discussion from new arrivals, she hesitantly raises her hand and introduces herself before unloading all of the thoughts that she's been holding back. She explains that things have been difficult because everyone in her family suffered from severe mental illness, her brother even dying after becoming convinced that their mother was trying to put people inside of him. The grandmother wasn't allowed anywhere near their son while he was growing up, but by the time that they had Charlie, she was living with them in their home and quickly developed a relationship with the girl that made Annie very uncomfortable. Meanwhile, Peter is hanging out in his room when he gets a text from a friend inviting him to a huge party coming up the next night. He has no idea that outside in the darkness, someone Someone is hiding in the treehouse and watching his every move. The next day, Charlie is working on her toys when she notices a strange flash of light pass over her bedroom walls and out through the window. Chasing it outside, she follows an adult-sized trail of footprints down a muddy path that leads from her treehouse out into the surrounding woods. Back inside, Peter knocks on the door of her mother's studio, asking if he can borrow the car for the night to go to a school event. Annie hardly looks up from her work to acknowledge him and tells him that if he's going, he needs to take his little sister along too. Reluctantly, the boy agrees to ask her, but when he goes to her room, she's nowhere in sight. Charlie follows the trail down to a clearing in the woods where she sees what looks like her grandmother in the distance, sitting in front of a burning ritual fire. Just then, Annie comes out and finds her, pulling her back inside without ever noticing the strange scene. She insists that Charlie goes with her brother, even though the girl doesn't actually want to. And so the two of them drive in silence, down the only road that leads to the party, passing an electrical pole marked with the occult symbol on their way. As soon as they get to the house, Peter immediately leaves Charlie unsupervised while he goes upstairs to try and impress a girl from his class. But that was his biggest mistake. Without anyone looking out for her, she ends up grabbing a slice of cake that's been baked with nuts and quickly starts having a severe allergic reaction. She finally manages to find him, saying that she's having trouble breathing, and once he realizes what's going on, picks her up and rushes her out to the car to take her to the hospital. 
Okay, I know Peter here wanted to get a little nuts at the party, but I don't think this is what he had in mind. It turns out that Charlie was born with a severe nut allergy, so when she accidentally ate some in the cake, her body's immune system started to overreact. This causes symptoms like difficulty breathing, swelling of the face, lowered blood pressure, and fainting. In the most severe cases, the person will go into a state called anaphylactic shock, which is life-threatening if not treated immediately. For people with bad enough allergies, doctors prescribe a medical device commonly known as an EpiPen, and encourage them to carry it at all times in case of such an emergency. Unfortunately, neither Annie nor Peter made sure that Charlie had hers before going to the party, which makes the situation much more dangerous. Instead of trying to ditch his sister with a bunch of strangers, what Peter should have done here was go up to the kids in the kitchen who were baking the cakes, and double-checked what ingredients they were using. If he saw that there were nuts involved, then he could have warned them that his sister was extremely allergic, making sure they knew not to let her have any. In in case she tried to grab some while he wasn't watching. As soon as he realized what was happening, Peter needed to have someone dial 911 and tell them that his sister was going into anaphylaxis, waiting for paramedics to arrive and only taking her to the hospital himself if he had no other option. He should avoid giving Charlie anything to drink, having her lie still on the ground with her face up, turn her on her side if she starts to vomit, and perform CPR chest compressions until the ambulance gets there if she stops breathing. Also, he could quickly search the bathroom or ask the kid who lives there for for any over-the-counter antihistamines, such as Zyrtec, Claritin, or preferably liquid Benadryl, and an albuterol inhaler. Although they won't be enough to save her life, anything that can help suppress the symptoms of the reaction would be helpful since they don't have an EpiPen available. Whether he's able to wait for the ambulance or forced to get there on his own, the most important thing would be to get Charlie to the emergency room as quickly as possible, and hand her over to the care of medical professionals who can treat and monitor her until the symptoms are clear. Right now, this might look like the worst case scenario, but the truth is that things are about to take a horrifying turn. Speeding down the pitch dark road, Charlie decides to stick her head out of the window to get some air. Suddenly, Peter notices a deer carcass blocking their path, and when he swerves to avoid it, he accidentally cuts too close to the electrical pole, causing his sister's head to slam into it and instantly knocking it off. That makes one family member down, with three more to go. Peter brings the car to a stop, aware of what's just happened, but not able to face it. After sitting there for a moment in silence, he thinks about looking into the back seat, but quickly turns away, releasing the brakes and slowly driving home. Arriving back at the house, he parks the car and walks inside, climbing into bed where he lays awake all night. In the morning, he hears Annie going out to run some errands, and she starts screaming when she finds her daughter's headless body still sitting in the back seat of the car, the girl's head laying in the dirt on the side of the road, slowly being eaten by the ants. The loss sends Annie into a spiral of grief, causing her and her son to drift even further apart. After the funeral, Steve goes to their bedroom to check on his wife, but sees that she isn't there, and someone has carved the word Zazas into the wall above their bed. Meanwhile, Annie decides to sleep out in the treehouse, trying to be closer to her daughter's memory by spending the night in her favorite spot. The next time that he's in class, Peter here has a vision of his sister's headless body in the car's rearview mirror. Later on, while he's hanging out with his degenerate friends under the bleachers, he has a full-blown panic attack and breaks breaks down crying. The kid stays out until after dark, afraid to go home and face his mother, and as soon as she sees him, she takes off to another support group meeting without saying a word. Sitting in the parking lot, Annie decides not to go in, but just as she's leaving, this woman, Joan, jumps in front of her car and stops her. The woman introduces herself and asks her how she's been feeling, opening up to her about losing her son and grandchild a few months ago, and writing down her phone number in case Annie ever wants to talk. When she finally gets back home, Steve is sitting awake waiting for her. Although he's just trying to comfort her, any interaction that they have scares Annie away, and she decides to spend the night out in the treehouse again instead. Peter lays there staring at the red glow from the space heaters through his bedroom window, when suddenly he hears a noise that sounds like his sister from somewhere in the room. Sitting up, he sees what looks like a headless body in the corner, but it just turns out to be a pile of his clothes on a chair. 
In the morning, while Annie's working on her models, an unseen force knocks over this jar of blue paint, and as she's cleaning it up, she sees that it spilled onto the note with Joan's phone number. Deciding to take her up on the offer, she heads across town to the woman's apartment for a chat. On her way in, Annie notices that the welcome mat looks just like the ones that her mother used to make. She finally opens up to the woman about the experience of discovering her daughter's body, and the emotions hitting her so hard that she takes some medication from her purse and swallows it with a sip of tea, noticing a strange substance on her lips when she wipes her mouth. Okay, Annie needs to be careful here. Joan might seem like a sweet old lady who just wants to help, but I know better than to trust people who flag me down in dark parking lots and start asking questions about my personal life. There's just been a few too many coincidences leading up to this for me. Running into the woman outside of the meeting as if she'd been watching her, the paint mysteriously being knocked over and happening to fall on the note with her phone number. I might be able to ignore all that, but the doormat looking identical to the ones that she had growing up? The ones that her mother made with her own two hands and not bought at the store? That's one coincidence too far for me. Let's take a quick look at it and see if anything sticks out. Right away, Annie should have noticed the two six-pointed stars sewn into the top right and bottom left of the mat. Harmless decorations? Maybe, but they could also be hinting at something way more concerning. This shape is known as a hexagram and has been used as a symbol that means different things in many religions throughout history, including the practice of occult magic, sometimes called the Seal of Solomon, who was a king of ancient Israel. It was said to give him the power to control the demons and genies and can be used in rituals to summon spirits. Then we have the strange substance that Annie notices on her lips after taking a sip of Joan's tea. Although it might just be a bit of something that didn't get washed off from the cup, if the woman is involved in practicing magic, it could mean that she intentionally added whatever it was into the drink. In witchcraft, a common practice is to brew potions, like tea here mixed with different types of herbs and ingredients, to achieve some desired effect. As for what it is, we have no way to tell right now, but I wouldn't drink any more of that tea just to be safe. These could be warning signs that Joan here is dabbling in some kind of dark magic, which could explain the mysteriously tipping paint jar, and possibly other strange occurrences that have been happening in the family's home. Although she doesn't have any definite proof yet, if I were Annie, I'd be keeping my new friend at a distance until I was sure that she had good intentions, and be ready to get the hell out of there or fight for my life if things started to get too supernatural for my liking. Joan changes the subject and asks about her son, which is when she finally admits why they're so distant. Annie here struggles with episodes of sleepwalking, and one night many years ago, when her two kids still shared a bed, she woke up standing over them, covered in paint thinner, and striking a match. Peter caught her at the same moment, holding it against her ever since, and no matter what she tries, nothing she says or does can fix their relationship. That night when the family sits down for dinner, there's a major sense of tension in the air. Everyone sits quietly, refusing to even look at each other. And when Peter eventually thanks his dad for making dinner, Annie can't help but laugh under her breath. The kid asks her if she has something to say, and that's when she finally explodes, letting out all of her bottled up anger. Standing up and slamming her hands on the table, she shouts that she's never felt like he loves her despite her trying her best to be a good mom. Now his sister is dead because of his actions actions, and she can't forgive him because he refuses to apologize or take any responsibility for what he's done. With the outburst over, the family sits there in stunned silence until Peter decides to instigate things even more, pointing out that Charlie wouldn't have been at the party if Annie hadn't forced her to go. Furious, Annie storms out of the room, and Steve reaches over to comfort his son, but he's clearly also at his breaking point. On her way out of the art supplies store, Annie notices Joan there in the parking lot Lot, loading things into her car. The woman seems overcome with some good news, pulling Annie off to the side and explaining that she met a medium who taught her a ritual that allowed her to communicate with the spirit of her dead grandson, Louis. She's skeptical at first, but Joan here insists that what she's saying is real and convinces her to come back to the apartment so that she can show her in person. The two of them sit in a pitch dark room as Joan lights a candle and begins the seance. Putting their hands on an upside down glass, Joan asks Louis spirit to prove that he's there by moving the object, and Annie pulls back horrified as the glass starts to slide around on its own. Annie checks under the table, but can't find anything to prove that it's a trick, while Joan keeps asking the spirit questions, and it moves the glass in response. Suddenly, a strange gust of wind blows Annie's hair, and the woman pulls out a chalkboard where the spirit starts to write
write her a message. Overwhelmed and frightened, Annie begs the woman to stop, but Joan reassures her that it's all completely harmless, and explains the process so that she can try it for herself when she gets home. After lighting a special candle, she'll need to choose an object that reminds her of Charlie before reading out a small spell that Joan gives her. It's written in a strange language that even she herself claims not to understand, but says that it was given to her by the medium and is necessary for getting the ritual started. Finally, she explains that everyone from her family needs to be in the house when she reads it, and Annie takes the items before rushing out of the apartment. That night, Annie rolls around unable to get to sleep when she notices a bunch of ants covering the floor and decides to follow their trail until she comes to Peter's bedroom. Looking in, she sees his body laying motionless as the ants crawl out of his mouth, only for him to sit straight up and calmly ask her what she's doing there. Almost involuntarily, she admits that she never wanted to be his mother, and even attempted to force herself not to give birth to him any way that she could, but insists that she was trying to save him, not kill him. Suddenly, the entire room bursts into flames, and Annie wakes up back in her bed. After a moment, she gets up and goes into the bathroom, closing herself inside and speaking the words to begin the ritual. Once she has things set, Annie wakes up Peter and Steve, manically apologizing for how she's been acting, and urging them to follow her so that she can show them something, even though it's just before two o'clock in the morning. Downstairs, she leads them to the dining room and begins explaining what they need to do. The boys are hesitant at first, but finally agree after she begs them to let her try, and Annie takes their hands as she calls out for Charlie's spirit to move the glass on the table. Peter says that he can feel the air around them flexing, and they watch in shock as the cup slides away from them on its own. Annie immediately takes out the girl's notebook and asks her to start drawing, but that's when a glass cabinet on the other side of the room shatters, and a huge burst of flame erupts from the candle before going out and then lighting again without any explanation. Suddenly, Annie starts to growl as she's overtaken by an unknown force and begins speaking in her dead daughter's voice. Terrified, Peter begs her to stop, and Steve throws a glass of cold water in her face, abruptly bringing the episode to an end, his wife having no idea what she's just done. They can all sense that something evil tried to make its way inside, but soon they're going to realize that it's already much too late. Okay, I think we all know what happened here, Annie. You 100% just unintentionally summoned a demon, and now your family is going to be in even more danger than they were before. You might still be in denial for now, but it doesn't take Ed and Lorraine Warren to figure this one out. Annie, you f up. I'm sorry to say it, but when it comes to ignoring red flags, you're up there as one of the goats. Seriously, at any point during all of this, did you ever once stop to think to yourself, you know what, something weird might be going on here. Your mother wanting to be buried with her strange symbolic jewelry, most of the people attending her funeral being total strangers. How about the literal writing on the wall above your daughter's bed? A 13 year old kid picking up the word Satoni? That's normal. Nothing to be too concerned about, right? It was only one night after she died until grandma's creepy smiling spirit was already appearing in the corner of your workshop. Maybe it has something to do with the whole ass black triangle carved into the floorboards of her bedroom? How is that still not enough to get your attention? Come on, lady, it's like you've never seen a horror movie before. That's not to mention your little sleepwalking stunt back in the day where you both tried to burn both of your children alive in their bed. Most sleepwalkers just wander over to the kitchen to make themselves a sandwich or something, but even your subconscious seems determined to make your kid's life a living hell. Poor Peter here was just trying to get some sleep, and and now, because of you, he's pretty much got the same backstory as Kylo Ren. Not exactly model parenting if you ask me, but what's worse is that you didn't stop there. All these years later, and instead of taking care of your kids, you'd rather work on your models and force Charlie to go to a party when she didn't even want to in the first place just to get her out of the house. You couldn't even do the bare minimum and make sure she had her life-saving medication before she went. Well, I guess we all saw how that one turned out. And then you've got your new friend, Joan. I tried to tell you right away that she was up to no good, but here we are. Let's just ignore the fact that only your second time ever at her house, she was already conjuring the spirits of dead children. Did you ever think for a second about the name of the kid who she was talking to? Louie. Now, what does that sound like it's short for? Lois, Louisiana, Ludwig von Beethoven? No, Lucifer. You know, the Prince of Darkness, Satan himself. Sound familiar? Here's a great idea. Let's take a magical spell from this lady written in a forgotten language and recite it out loud in your bathroom in the middle of the night. 
What could possibly go wrong? Now, anyone with the slightest amount of common sense knows never to repeat ancient summoning spells that they can't understand out loud. It's the same reason that you don't sign a contract without reading over the fine print. You gotta know what you're getting yourself into. I swear, some people could read from the damn Necronomicon itself and then wonder why the demons showed up to swallow their souls. There's some things in life that you just don't mess with, but I guess some of us need to learn the lesson the hard way. But how am I so sure that you've just invited in a demon? We know that they're attracted to families that hate each other, which describes you and yours perfectly. There's the breaking of glass, the thrusts of flame, and oh yeah, the fact that you were briefly taken over by a spirit of your dead daughter. That's a sure sign of textbook demonic possession if I've ever seen it. And I'd say right now, it's time to get an exorcist over there before one of you ends up crawling on the ceiling with your head spinning around like a Beyblade. I wish I could say that I still had any confidence in you managing to get out of this one, but from what we've seen so far, the odds aren't looking very good. When you do such a terrible job at picking up on the red flags that you end up with a new demonic roommate, Annie, you f up. The next night, Annie hears a strange noise and follows it into her daughter's room, where she sees the girl's notebook laying open on the bed and drawing sketches by itself. Meanwhile, Peter's trying to get some sleep, but he hears a noise that wakes him up and looks over to see his sister standing there in the corner of the room. Just then, her head falls off and rolls towards him, turning into a toy ball when it hits the floor. Their dog stands in the doorway, snarling at something unseen, when suddenly, a woman's arms reach out from behind his bed and pull him down to the mattress choking him, and the bedroom door slams shut. Waking up, Peter sees Annie standing there in the room and immediately starts to accuse her of trying to kill him once again. Grabbing him by the shoulders, she promises that she's going to fix whatever's happening before it gets any worse. Determined to set things right, Annie brings the notebook down to the fireplace and tosses it in. But when she does, her shirt sleeve immediately lights on fire too. She tries slapping it out, but nothing works, only managing to stop it when she pulls the book out of the flames. In the morning, she goes back to Joan's apartment, looking to get some answers, but the woman is nowhere to be found. Annie can't see through the curtains on the door, but inside of the apartment is an altar complete with the severed heads of small animals, and a picture of her son in a carved out triangle surrounded by candles. Looking at the welcome mat, she's reminded of her mother and gets an idea for a new lead. Meanwhile, Peter is sitting outside of the school eating lunch when he sees Joan watching him from across the street. The woman shouts out several magic words, saying that she expels him and ordering him to get out of his body. While sitting in class, Peter Peter's arm suddenly shoots above his head like a puppet on a string, his face contorting as everyone else stares at him in fear and confusion. Suddenly, he slams his face down hard into his desk, before being lifted up and slammed down a second time even harder. Snapping out of it, he falls onto the floor, screaming at the top of his lungs. Back at the house, Annie starts going through her mother's old stuff and finds the welcome mats that she made for her and her brother, noticing that the one for Charles is stitched with the cult's symbol. In another box, she finds a book with the same symbol on its cover, but the pages are full of a strange, unreadable language. Buried underneath is a book titled Invocations, and that's when she makes a horrifying discovery. The marked page provides a detailed description of an entity known as King Paimon, a god of mischief who starts out by possessing the most vulnerable host when summoned, and ultimately desires to possess the body of a human male, rewarding the followers who do his bidding with unimaginable wealth. Flipping through an old photo album, she sees pictures of her mother with Joan wearing the cult's symbol on their necklaces, and members of the cult showering the woman with gold coins, revealing that she was actually their leader all along. Okay, this is not good. What do you do when you combine a camel, a marching band, and the power to control 200 legions of demons? Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to Paimon, one of the eight kings of hell, and pretty much the last guy that you'd want marrying your grandma. Once an angel living in heaven, it's said that Paimon sided with Lucifer during his war against God, becoming his most loyal servant after the rebellion failed and they were banished to the depths of hell. Contacting him requires a carefully prepared ritual sacrifice and even then, it's impossible to tell what kind of chaos that he might cause when summoned. For those brave or foolish enough to conjure him, Paimon can grant them knowledge, wealth, and power over anyone that they desire. But as with any all-knowing spirit, it's in 
important to be careful what you wish for. Annie here is about to realize that her mother's secret friends were actually members of Paimon's cult, and now they're planning to use her family as a sacrifice to their demonic king. Things are looking pretty bad, but there was one sentence in that book that Annie opened that gives me an idea. Paimon desires a male human body to inhabit, which is bad news for Peter, unless of course they can find someone else to take his place. It's a cutthroat move, but if she can figure out the details of the ritual process before it's too late, she could try tricking one of his annoying male classmates into filling the role instead. When all else fails, it doesn't hurt to try a meat shield. Well, it doesn't hurt you anyway. There's no way to tell if it'll actually work, but when you're faced with the possibility of becoming the vessel for a demonic king of hell, you need to consider your options. Now, another thing that's important to remember about cults is that they need a leader to keep them on track. After their grandmother's death, it looks like Joan here came along and took over her spot. So taking her out might set back their plans enough to give the family a chance to escape. They'll have to find her first, but the good news is that she seems to be stalking Peter, because he saw her standing across the street from his school. Knowing this, it might be possible to use him as bait to lure her out. They need his body to complete the ritual, so if you were to put him in a dangerous situation where it looked like he might die before the cult could finish their plot, Joan would probably reveal herself, and that would be their moment to strike. It shouldn't be too hard to win a fight against a single old lady, and it'd be much better to battle her on your own terms than when she and the cult are at their full power. But unfortunately for the family, it looks like they're already too far gone to put up any sort of fight. On a hunch, Annie goes out to the hallway and pulls open the door to the attic as a swarm of flies surround her. Climbing up, she grabs a flashlight and starts looking around, only to see her mother's decayed and headless body laying there in the corner, dressed in a gown embroidered with the cult's symbol and with a lit candle placed between her legs. On the wall above her is another image of the cult's symbol, this time drawn in somebody's blood. Steve picks Peter up from school, and as soon as they pull into the driveway, Annie comes running out to greet them, rambling about the evidence that she's found. Once they get the kid to bed, she tells him about the headless body in the attic and brings him to go and look for himself. Not believing a word she says, Steve pulls the attic door open and is immediately surrounded by the flies, the expression on his face changing from frustration to terror. While he's checking it out, Annie goes to the fireplace and gets it started before coming back with the photo album, but Steve refuses to even look at it, questioning why she wouldn't have called the police yet and thinking instead that she must have been the one who dug up her mother's body and put it there in the attic. Annie insists that she accidentally opened them up to the demonic force that's attacking their family, and in order to save Peter's life, they need to toss Charlie's notebook into the fireplace. But when they do it, she expects to be killed too. She's too afraid to throw the book in herself, so she leads him to the fireplace and begs him to do it for her. Taking the book, Steve turns and walks towards the fire, but stops to face her at the last moment, saying that he isn't going to keep supporting her delusional episodes anymore. Annie lunges towards him, grabbing the book and throwing it in herself, only for Steve to immediately burst into flames right in front of her eyes. While she watches her husband burn alive, the strange beam of light passes over her, and the demon takes complete possession of her body. That makes two family members down, with two more to go. Okay, Poor Steve. One day the guy's just living his life, trying his best to take care of his family, and a few seances later, boom, incarcerated by a demon. So what could he have done, you know, besides stop, drop, and roll? Annie here insisted that they couldn't get help from the police, when in reality, that's exactly what Steve needed to do. And not just the police, but a priest as well. And Peter was attacked at school. Instead of taking him back home where all of the trouble started, I would have brought him straight to a church and had the real professionals tell me what to do next. Even the most successful demonologists call in a priest when it's time to break out the heavy artillery. And if there's one place in the world that you might be safe from old Paimon here, it's probably in the house of the Lord. As soon as Annie found the body, the right thing to do would have been to contact the police. Although they probably can't fight a demon for you, just getting them involved should slow down the cult enough to at least buy you some more time. Also, since the cult clearly needs the grandmother's body to complete the 
ritual, they could have tried having it cremated instead to put a stop to their plans. Steve already knows that they were in big trouble, but now it looks like he's really feeling the heat, and it's time for the cult to make their final move. When darkness falls, the house is quickly surrounded by countless birthday-suited members of the cult. Peter wakes up in bed and sees a light coming from the treehouse, but this time, it looks like a burning flame. Sitting up, he calls out for his mom, having no idea that she's right behind him, perched like a spider on the ceiling in the corner of the room. Just as he looks over his shoulder, Annie silently crawls through the air and out into the hall. Walking around in the darkness, he hears several crashes come from downstairs and cautiously goes to check them out. As he walks past the front door, a second shadow follows his own across the hall. In the living room, he sees his father's burned and headless body laying in front of the fireplace, Annie watching him from the ceiling just out of sight. That's when Peter hears a door creak behind him, turning around only to see a member of the cult smiling at him from the shadows. Suddenly, Annie rushes at him from the corner with a demonic roar, chasing him upstairs into the attic. Peter pulls the ladder up just in time, begging her to stop, while she hangs upside down on the ceiling and smashes her head into the door like a jackhammer. Looking around, he notices the imprint where his grandmother's body was laying, but the corpse itself is no longer there, and a picture of him with his eyes gouged out has taken its place. Thinking that it must be a nightmare, Peter starts desperately trying to wake himself up, but stops when he hears the sounds of someone slicing through skin. When he looks above him, he sees Annie floating up by the ceiling and sawing through her own neck with a metal wire, staring straight at him, but not saying a word. The woman starts cutting faster and faster with inhuman speed, and just then, Peter sees that three more cultists somehow have him trapped. Terrified and with nowhere left to run, he dives out of the window into the garden below, stunning himself from the impact. Suddenly, the cutting noises stop, and the shadow of his mother's headless body floats over him towards the treehouse as the strange ball of light passes through his back. That makes all four family members down, and the ritual of King Paimon is about to be complete. Now possessed by the demon, Peter watches as his mother's corpse floats up into the treehouse before getting up to follow her. Inside, he sees a large group of cultists kneeling down to pray in front of a demonic figure topped with his sister's decayed head. The bodies of his mother and grandmother arranged in a ritualistic pose on the floor below. Joan comes and places a crown on top of his head, explaining how they've accomplished their goal and allowed the demon to possess a male host. While he stands there, eyes wide and drooling, the cultists pray to him for wealth, power, and knowledge before breaking out into a chant of Hail Paimon. Their twisted ritual is finally complete. But what would you do? If your mother recently passed away and you started noticing weird things happening around the house, old friends of hers popping up out of nowhere, and generally just the feeling of unease that she might be watching you from beyond the grave, would you see a medium and investigate it further? Or would you just automatically assume that she was a part of some sort of supernatural death cult? Let us know down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out the How to Beat playlist for more videos just like this. We upload new videos on Wednesday and Saturday and check out the new show, The Kill Plan, which just launched on the channel. We'll see you next time and have a damn good day.